after people, you know, keep on coming. So, all right. Good morning, everybody. So uh, thanks for coming into this uh, uh, workshop today. We know it's a really beautiful day outside and uh, we will try to make this workshop maybe, you know, even more beautiful to keep you engaged. So thanks again for coming. And uh, I will tell a little bit about this uh, uh, software. So uh, this software is good for uh, device simulation and also process simulation uh, of semiconductors. So we will, uh, uh, you know, in this workshop, we'll provide you the overview and uh, we will give you uh, two perspectives, one from a user's standpoint and one from our uh, staff standpoint. So thanks to Simone, he was our first user or one of the first users to use this software. So he will tell you for the last several months uh, how he feels about it, what he has done. And, uh, and then Ying is here. She is going to give you a detailed tutorial about how to use this uh, software and uh, what it can do. And you guys can ask uh, questions that Katie said in the beginning in the chat, and they will answer uh, uh, your questions. So again, with that, I should also say that, uh, uh, and thanks to Simone for making time to you, you know come here and give his user's perspective. And uh, thanks to Ying for arranging all this thing. This all workshop was uh, his her idea and uh, her effort. Uh, at the tomorrow, actually, we will sending out a survey uh, about this workshop. So let us know how do you feel about it. So the one idea is to see we have a one license for this, and anybody. Any one of you who wants to try this after today's workshop can contact Ying and uh, you know just send her an email and she can you know give uh, reserve some time for you on it, so you you could use it. We have just one license uh, at this point, but we are uh, uh, looking into getting more for the next year, so that is one idea too. So let us know in your survey what do you think about it, and uh, you can always you know try as I said before, and give your opinion to Ying even after, uh, you know, uh, the survey. So I will pass on to Ying now. So Ying, please take over now. Hello, uh, everyone. Um, I, yeah, I will start sharing my screen. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So uh, just a brief introduce myself <coughs> and the <coughs> staff in the <coughs> UFAB. Uh, being here for several years. And uh, uh, so I will be a contact person if you want to use this software. And if you have a question, also directly contact me. OK, so um, I will go through a very brief introduction about uh, the overview of the software. And the main idea that I hope this software can help you design and fabricate your device with confidence. With confidence. Okay, so the outline. Uh, we want to see, uh, so first I will introduce what is TCAD and uh, then what does TCAD solve and uh, why you want to use TCAD and uh, who use TCAD and what are the application areas. And then we will go through, go take a closer look at the tool and I will show you how the interaction tools looks like. And then we will go to a few examples uh, about how to simulate the process and how to simulate the device. <clears throat> All right, TCAD, uh, <clears throat> the full name of TCAD is Technology Computer Aided Design. Uh, so it has basically two major functions. One is process simulation, one is a device simulation. Uh, for the process simulation, uh, I show the picture here. Uh, it's, uh, it's use uh, the known physics semiconductor fabrication uh, techniques, and it can show you as you do the fabrication, 
how your device will look like. For example, you come to the new fab clean room, you do the photolithography, you do the edge, you do the doping, uh, everything. <clears throat> but uh, you do, with this software, you don't have to do it on hands. You just put those simulation commands and it virtually simulate for you and it g gives you what your device will, <clears throat> will look like after all those process. <clears throat> so that's the device the, pro the process simulation. For the device simulation, it's about uh, uh, it's mainly answers the question about how your device will perform after you build it up, after you apply it, for example, current or voltage, and how the uh, characteristic looks like, for example, the IV curve or even photo uh, uh, photo response. So it's uh, it uses the physics and it simulates inside uh, the device. It not only gives you what the output, it also gives you, for example, in this picture, the electric field contour all inside the device. So this answers your question, why the device gives you this kind of result. Okay, next slide. Okay, so why do you want to use TCAD? Uh, first, TCAD uh, is not limited to university or uh, research tools. It's more generally used in industry. Uh, so because it's a virtual, virtual uh, uh, experiment, so you don't have to do everything by hand and that can reduce the development time and cost for the semiconductor technology a lot. So uh, in industry, it can reduce the development cycle by 30%. So, uh, and the industry here means many major semiconductor uh, companies like Intel, uh, uh, yeah, uh, and, uh, and the land research. So those kind of company, companies are user of this TCAD. And uh, it visualizes the internal physics process. So it allows you to see inside the device. Uh, and it, because when you do the measurement, it has give you the result. It just tells you what happened and what's the result. But TCAD, it looks into it and it uses physics to explain why you get this kind of result. <laughs> and it's a, it's a virtual experimentation. So it, it, because it's virtual, so you don't need to uh, spend too much time, too much effort. and. Uh, 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 you see, for example, in the case that like if your device exhibits some unexpected characteristic, and uh, you probably want to use this TCAD to try different simulation series and see if you can explain this, this unexpected result. If you get a, a theory match, the measurement, measurement result is a good chance that you have found the cause. So it's easy for you to diagnose what's wrong with your device. <laughs> And uh, it's widely used in leading uh, semiconductor companies. So as a user, especially as you as a student in the university, uh, if you can do this one, you can know this skill, it's gonna be a great plus if you're looking for a job in the semiconductor area. Okay, so uh, who is using TCAD? So again, the most the major users are from uh, industry. So the foundries, and uh, the integrated device manufacturers. So because when they, uh, they use it, when they start to uh, have a complex, complex uh, foundry process, uh, you know, in the current, in the modern foundries, a device easily involves like over 20 or 30 steps. And if that happens and you want to see, you don't want to see everything at the end, you want to, try it virtually first, and then you get a good anticipation for what will give you after all this real device fabrication or uh, simulation. Uh, so run, uh, when you run the wafer, uh, wafer start to cost money and it's very time consuming. And it's an algorithm that you want to run it virtually and try to reduce the time and get a good starting point. And when the new emerging emerge, emerging technology is coming into the first the early phase and they start to gain a commercial edge, this is when 
uh, you will have a reliable, we won't have a reliable uh, devices. After every process, uh, you want to make sure you have the uh, successful rate or the test rate is good. So um, this is where you can precisely find which parameter matters and then you can uh, uh, make a fine control during the fabrication. Okay, and for the fabulous companies, so uh, they, they, the fabulous company means they don't do the fabrication. They uh, contract the foundries and the integrated device manufacturers do their device. So uh, this is this too can be used to understand better the device performance and how it tuned to the application. Also, it's a great communication tool because you use this one, it can deliver all the information, all the process, all the parameter information to the foundry without error. Okay. Mm. And the third is, of course, our, our users here uh, is research organizations, including uh, universities and governments. And I believe everybody want, here want to use it to explore some new design of physics or some new concepts. And uh, even some students in the classroom, they can use this to, to learn the semiconductor physics. Okay. Uh, so this show, picture shows generally uh, which applica the application areas for this software. Uh, so it's pretty wide from display, like LED or LED and the power device. Uh, so user, usually with silicon carbide, gallium nitride, and the reliability device, optical for CCD cameras, and even advanced process uh, development, for example, the chips and the memories. So those, everything can be simulated here. And uh, later, uh, Simone will give us a talk about uh, his research using this TCAD. Uh, so he does uh, the 35 opti optical electronics and uh, he will answer two questions, uh, how he used to how he uses to to explain the observed uh, experiment behavior, and how he uses to to improve the device and get the desired uh, characteristics. All right. So now uh, we can take a look how this TCAT two looks and how the workflow goes. Uh, so first, uh, this is inter. Uh, this has uh, it's it has interactive deck development and the runtime environment. Uh, so this environment, we have two. Uh, so one is for the single simulation runtime environment, and one is for multi-simulation runtime environment. Uh, so the multi one is called, the single one called deck build, uh, which we will use later in the demo. And the multi one is for uh, the DOE, the design of experiment. And uh, this is called virtual wafer fab. We're not going to go through this, it's a little bit advanced more layer, but uh, we'll start with a simple uh, si single simulation in the demo. Okay, so when you come to this uh, environment, we have two major functions. Again, as I said before, we have process simulation and device simulation. For the process, start the, 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 two, the workflow with these two, start with process simulation. It has, has a module called Asana. Uh, so this is uh, uh, used to simulate the process. <laughs> so uh, you put all those commands like uh, edge deposit films, and then it will uh, generate a structure file. So this structure file describes how your microstructure of your device looks like. And this structure file can be inputted into another module called Atlas. So this Atlas is for device simulation. So it has a lot of built-in uh, physical uh, functions, just like the formulas on your textbook and the models, everything is built in this Atlas. So it will, uh, uh, and then you can say, I apply a voltage, I, excite the device with the light beam and it will uh, gives you what's the solution. So solution usually, usually means IV curves, like a photoresponse, uh, the output beam, so those kind of things. 
So, and it also gives you a log file. Log file, of, actually log file means IV curve. Solution file usually means uh, the electrical uh, field distribution or the light distribution in the space. And it meantime, it also gives you the runtime output. The runtime output is mostly used for diagnose the, the codes you put into the simulation. And in the, at last, we will have a visu visualization too, which is called Tony plot. So you can open the log files and look, open the solution files with the Tony plot and uh, uh, you will see how it looks like and we'll give you some examples soon. And uh, generally this is uh, how the workflow. So we start with uh, uh, building the device using all the uh, fabrication commands and then we will plug in the physics models and then we will uh, solve this device and finally, we will see the result with the tiny plot. Okay, so this is a close look at of the deck build because everything starts with deck build and this, this part is the deck build part and this is tiny plot part. Uh, so this is input and this is output. So this is how it looks like. Uh, in the deck build, so you have a window like this and we have a bunch of two bars up here. And uh, uh, and down here is the deck editor. So you see we have some commands right in there and we will go through these commands later. And you can press the button to run the commands. And here we have the runtime output. So it tells you which line is running and uh, uh, if, if, if there's some uh, syntax error, it also tells you that you need to fix something and uh, in the end, it tells you it's finished. And uh, here, here, if you have any variables that you want to extract uh, in the code, so it will show up down here. And uh, this part is output files. So it's likely you will have some structure file to show the device structure or the IV curves of for, for the output and those files will generate it and show up here. So then you can just double click on it and then it, the tiny plot will show you how the file looks like. So here's an example of the tiny plot. So this is um, the structure file. Uh, this is a uh, mouse T F E F E T. Uh, so it looks like, so it has, uh, I don't know exactly, but see you have, um, this is, the color contour here is for the net doping. So it shows your doping concentration in the space and also shows you the material. Uh, so we have silicon, silicon oxide and electrode, those kind of materials. So it show up in this picture together. And here uh, actually it shows uh, uh, the doping uh, as a function of the space. Uh, yeah, this is just an example to just give you a brief idea how these things looks like. Uh, okay, all right. So uh, before we go in deep to how these things works and how you use it, I want to put uh, my kind of alarm here uh, that uh, to give you the right expectation. Uh, what's the challenge for using this tool? Um, so it's not like any equipment in the new fab. Uh, so we have a standard operation procedure. You just follow that push buttons and you will get what you want. It's not like that with these two. There's a learning curve. Uh, so you got to spend time, learn it. Uh, but before you learn it, the most important thing is that you need to understand the physics involved in your device. Uh, if you do the field effect device, uh, you got to know how the carriers flows in your device, like what's a majority carrier and what's a minor, and then uh, like a recombination rate, the left time, the scattering. So all those detailed physics, you got to have a clear idea because when you come into the device simulation, the models you choose, the parameter you put in the formula, everything starts to matter. You got to have a clear idea about the physics and the parameters. Otherwise you cannot get the right simulation. Okay, and the second is you must know your device, your materials and your process. 
as detailed as possible. So the more detail, the more easier you can reproduce the experiment. Uh, let's say if you have a doped wafer, you must make sure you know what is the dopant, uh, you know what's the doping, uh, uh, doping uh, concentration, you know the orientation of the wafer. So this is the basic information for you to input into the, into the TCAD too. Uh, if you don't know it, it, it can still run, but you may not get what you want. So know your device, know your materials and process as much, as detailed as possible. And then beware of the learning curve. And uh, as we go into the demo, you will find uh, it's like something uh, to learn. It's not definitely not like as bad as a, uh, as a programming language, but there's some language syntax you need to learn. Uh, beware of the learning curve. and. Uh, the third, the final one is understand that you have trade-off between accuracy and the simulation time, uh, because we have only one lesson and then you cannot book it for forever, and then that means you only have limited simulation time. We definitely will consider as if we need that we can consider increase the lessons, but uh, I believe nobody wants to spend endless time on the simulation, and that means you cannot achieve the unlimited accuracy. So at some point you got to balance the accuracy and how much effort you want to spend on the simulation. Okay, uh, now uh, I will just uh, briefly introduce uh, the demos we will do later. Uh, so the first demo is about uh, a process simulation. So I choose the example for a bipolar junction fabrication. So this is just to show the uh, scratch of the junction is NPN junction. And uh, this is the output from the TCAT simulation. So in this demo, we will go through all these steps. Uh, so, uh, so we will first define the n doped substrate and then we will dope the P-tap area. And then we'll deposit silicon, uh, polysilicon, and dope the polysilicon to make the N area. And we'll also deposit some silicon nitride, and then deposit some uh, contact materials and etch out of contact materials. So eventually, we will make this type of uh, uh, NPN junction. So, and the, here we can see the doping concentration as a function in uh, uh, the the space. Uh, the spatial uh, doping concentration. Okay, so this is the first process. And the second one is uh, device simulation. Uh, so device simulation, I choose a PIN photodiode. So photodiode is very commonly uh, available, commercial available. And I know many users of our new fab that they use this kind of diode and uh, they build a device on it and see how this, uh, uh, how, how, how this diode uh, behaves. So it usually have this kind of structure and it has P-dope on the top and dope at the bottom. And uh, we have the two contacts, one contacting the top and one contacting the bottom. And then you have light shine on it and then you want to get the optical response. Okay, so for this demo, we will first define the doping regions, and then we will select the physics models for the carriers. Then we will set up uh, the initial operating bias, which is like the voltage applied on this diode. And uh, then we will specify what kind of light we want to apply onto the device, and then eventually we will solve this optical response. So the photo current as a function, so this shows the photo current as function of uh, wavelengths. And this one shows the doping concentration in this device. So this is two output. And we will go through these two demos after the break. Okay, so uh, that's all I want to present for now. Um, and we have some minutes uh, before we can start Simone's talk, uh, I want, let me see if I have any question. Okay, so I got one question from Ken. 
uh, if we experimentally characterize electrical transport property of a material, let's call it the material X, and can we similar device made of the material X by plugging the charger? Uh, the, the, quick question, the quick answer is yes, but uh, it really depends on what of a material. Uh, the reason is because this TCAT is primarily built for the semiconductor industry. It has a lot of built-in materials, but those building built-in materials are limited to the semiconductor, like silicon and the silicon nitride, silicon oxide, and or three and five. So those commonly used, so those materials commonly used in the uh, in the uh, industry are directly there. You don't need to plug in charge carriers, carry density, anything like that. Um, but if you have other materials and you have to manually input, um, so I'm not going to go in detail, but there is a menu and I can show you which section that uh, the, how you can kind of add a material in the library. Okay, so the, ses the second question from Julian say, does this software use T I, okay, I don't know FDTD, so can you explain, Julian? Oh, sorry, uh, finite difference time domain. Uh, it's oh. a method for simulating uh, physics models um, where you solve Maxwell's equations uh, in, yeah. or in this case, Maxwell's equations. Yes, it has that. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, so uh, I will just uh, stop and give this screen to Simon, Simone. Okay. All right, so I will share some insights um, on Atlas, which is the device simulation part of, the, of Silvaco. Um, so a bit of background in my group, we've used uh, this part of Silvaco for like six, seven years. I've used it for like three or four. And up until last year, uh, we used to purchase our own license. And uh, I think like I contacted Nasir and Ying saying that this should be interesting for them and for their users. And I think this is a great opportunity for every new fab user and nuance user um, because the license tend to be expensive. So sometimes it's, uh, it's, it might not be easy to get a continuous license for a couple of years and develop uh, a research, um, topic on Silvaco. And I think having new fab sort of like purchase the, the license and then have users, uh, pay for their use, uh, is, is a great thing. I'm happy that Nasir and Ying found this interesting. So in my group. What we mostly use, uh, uh, as I said, is the Atlas, which is the device simulation software. And uh, you can use this individually without needing to go through the, the process simulation, but you can uh, also connect it to the process simulation as, as Ying showed. Uh, what we use it for is, uh, like Ying was saying, to develop a physical understanding of the devices. Uh, so oftentimes you see some, some experimental results that you don't know uh, how to explain. And by playing with different models and different physical phenomena that you can include or exclude from these models, you can tell uh, what specifically causes some uh, results, some effects that you see experimentally. Um, Another thing that it's useful for is we use this to bridge uh, analytical tools, which are typically simplified and like one dimensional and, uh, and experimental tools, which is like uh, you tend to investigate the structure and you can use this uh, numerical simulation tool to bridge between the two, which is uh, it's a more complex simulation, but it, it, uh, it can capture the three dimensional nature of the devices. And then we uh, sometimes, I mean, we use this to investigate the physical phenomena, whether they are happening in our device or not, whether we can make devices that capture those phenomena. And finally, to guide the design of novel devices by uh, trying to optimize their performance. So a couple examples of questions that we try to address using Silvaco 
atlas. Um, so, like I said, we observe this this behavior that we can't explain what what physical mechanism explains that. Um, how can we improve some type of device performance uh, by changing parameters, like changing a thickness or a doping? Uh, will that give us better detectivity, for example? Um, then what are desirable features for, for a device? Is it better to have, I don't know, two gates or one gate in a transistor and stuff like that? And then can we extract material parameters or device parameters from the experimental results. Obviously, if you build a physical model input uh, with, with some parameters and in input and you get the experimental, and you get an output that matches the experimental results, then those are likely good uh, parameters for the material. And I'll have a little more on that later. So uh, before that, I should mention, uh, like they said before, my group uh, works in optoelectronics and we uh, mostly work with 3.5 uh, semiconductors, but we occasionally work with silicon too. So I'm gonna go uh, over and try to introduce you uh, to the syntax of, uh, of Atlas. Sorry, my computer is running out of battery. Uh, so that, um, Differently from uh, the, the process simulation from Athena, uh, Atlas is much more uh, code-like. The, the deck build has a lot of uh, function that you have to hard code. And typically the general format of the syntax is like, uh, like this that you see here, you have a statement and then you have a series of parameters that you assign values to. So here you can see as an example, you have the statement mesh to define the mesh and you have the location that has some value and the spacing that has some value. Uh, similarly, you have statement electrode and you give it a name or you give it, you assign it a material. So the way you build your simulation is going through five steps. The first is the specification of the structure. So in this step, you assign, for example, a mesh, uh, refine the mesh, assign spacing to the mesh. You define the three-dimensional structure. Uh, you define where the electrodes are and what type of electrodes they are, as well as the doping uh, concentration and distribution. Uh, this part can also be imported from Athena. So you will see uh, in, the, in the demo, Ying will show you, you can uh, build your own structure instead of uh, coding it as I will show. Uh, the second step is to define the materials and the models. And uh, Silvaca has a lot of uh, built-in functions and I will show some of them. And this includes the materials, the models, the type of contact and the type of interfaces between the materials. Um, then you, you select the numerical method that you want to use to solve your differential equations. And um, finally, there's uh, two steps for the output and results uh, analysis. Uh, you have to specify what you would like to get in output before you solve. And I will show you some of that. And, uh, and finally, you have uh, two types of analysis. Either you export the, the file, the results, or you look at them in Tonyplot, which is this uh, plotting software that Silvaco comes with. So for the first step, you want to define the mesh. Uh, for those of you that don't know what a mesh is, is uh, a very common tool used for solving uh, differential equations. Uh, a mesh breaks up a physical two-dimensional or three-dimensional structure into points uh, that are called nodes, and then solves the differential equations uh, uh, numerically at each of those points. So obviously, the most relevant uh, regions of your of your device will, or, or the most uh, finicky to model will need more points. So typically you want to define a mesh that's more uh, refined in the points uh, that are more critical for the device. So the basic standard um, statements for the mesh are whether you want a cylindrical or a rectangular um, geometry. Cylindrical is obviously like actual symmetry. So you 
what you see is a 2D cut of, uh, of the de device that is symmetric around an axis and uh, rectangular is just a, a 2D slice of a 3D device. So you specify that. And then, um, for example, if you have uh, a rectangular, or actually in both cases, you can simply define uh, the number of uh, grids of cell or uh, of nodes that you have in your simulation window. So in this example here, you define the mesh. Uh, if you don't specify cylindrical or rectangular, it will default to rectangular. And in this case, you want 36 points on the X axis and 30 points on the Y axis. A little more um, fancy type of mesh is, for example, this one that I'm showing here. And because the statement that I showed before would be a uniformly spaced uh, mesh, uh, which is typically not needed for most devices because uh, there's usually parts that are more critical and you want a finer mesh in, but you can live with uh, a much coarse, much more coarse uh, mesh in other area of the device. So for that, you can use the location and the spacing uh, syntax. So in this case, uh, for example, I'm, I'm specifying cylindrical mesh just to give a different example, but then you can specify uh, that at some location, you want some type of spacing, which is more fine. For example, here, uh, the first two lines, and then at other location, you you want a more coarse uh, mesh. So the way this works is the first location is where that spacing starts to be applied, and the second and and that will stop at the next x location. So in this case, for example, from zero to one, the spacing will be zero, 0 point one. From 1 to 10, the spacing will be 0 0.1. From 10 to 15, it will be 1. And from 15 till the edge of the simulation, it will be 1 again. The second part of the structure definition is the region um, definition. So this defines the different regions of your device. Um, so you assign a number to the region, which is going to be used later for um, for example, for plotting or for defining, uh, diff you can define uh, different models across different regions, for example. And so that's why you assign a number. You can also assign it a name, as you see down here. So region number one, name top or name uh, subcollector. And then you assign uh, a bunch of uh, properties to, to this region. Uh, in this example down here, I have a couple of materials in gas, in gas B, and in phosphide. And then a bunch of other properties like uh, doping concentration. But first, uh, you define the boundaries of this region. So in this case, uh, for example, I'm showing here on the top in this in this figure that you don't need to have a uniform 2D slice. You can have a three-dimensional structure. So in this case, what you see in purple is air. So the device is really uh, three-dimensional, it's really a, a tiny pillar at the top and a, a larger area at the bottom. Um, and of course, here you define each of these uh, rectangles that you see here. Uh, you see that they're different material and you define where they go from in terms of X, like X min and X max, and then in terms of Y. So that defines the four corners of the rectangle. Uh, one thing I should mention is uh, when you define the region, you also can define the doping, and they have a lot of built-in types of doping, like uh, uniform doping, Gaussian doping, delta doping, uh, the doping type, and concentration. Here you see uh, in this example down here, I have donor, uh, so uh, n-type doping uh, with a concentration, but at the uh, bottom line, I actually have a gradient doping. So I have ND, so donor concentration at the top and at the bottom. So you can also define a varying uh, doping across the device. Then you specify the electrodes and the contacts. So um, again, with the electrode, you also can assign it a name and a location and a position. And uh, the reason I'm showing this example is because uh, we have we want an, an electrode at the top and one at the bottom, but our top, as I said, is not it doesn't extend to the whole uh, simulation region. 
So you can define the electorate to be only on some part of the region, which is useful in this case, but it's also useful in like bipolar junction transistor and stuff like that. So the electorate doesn't typically get displayed in, the, in this uh, type of plots, but you can define where they are. And if you don't, like uh, the, the last line here, electorate bottom, it will take the whole uh, simulation domain at the bottom. For the contact, you can also define the type of contact. So you can either define the impedance or uh, specify a Schottky uh, barrier for Schottky contacts or ohmic contacts. The next step is to define the material and the interfaces. This is uh, by far the most challenging part of Atlas, in my opinion. And this sort of uh, brings up the question that, uh, that John was asking. You, um, this software is built mostly for silicon. So if you work with silicon, pretty much all, they have pretty much all the parameters that you may wish for, and they're very reliable. Uh, we work with 3.5. They have pretty good uh, like built-in functions and parameters for 3.5. Uh, they recently added like graphene, uh, other like 2.6. Uh, so there's a lot of built-in and, and I think the community is adding to that, but the more, the least, the further away you get from silicon, the more you will have to provide your own input uh, parameters for a material. So for example, uh, in the previous uh, slide, I showed you that you can specify ingas, and they have a built-in for ingas. Uh, that is not accurate enough for us. So what we do is we specify each single parameter in this case for, for, for ingas, for example, such as uh, the electron affinity, the, um, um, I mean, the band gap at 300 uh, Kelvin, the band alignment, the recombination times, et cetera. And you can define all the parameters that I listed here and many more. And of course, it's a bit of a trial and error. Like if you start from the built-in parameters, then you can uh, start refining them throughout uh, the, the project, uh, especially relying on the experimental results. And then the same you can do for the interface. Uh, interface, there's less built-in, obviously. Uh, so you can specify the charge density at an interface or the recombination um, rates. Uh, finally, you want to specify the models and the methods. Um, they have a lot of models that you can use. Uh, they have models for mobility, for recombination, such, such as a uh, shot clear it hall, Auger, uh, carrier statistics, impact organization, tunneling. Uh, the, manual for the scientific manual is like uh, I think 2000 pages you can just go and find whatever method is appropriate for you I think just on impact ionization they have something like 10 models uh, but typically you can build through the expertise as you go on and add like more refined model every time and then the methods is uh, simply the methods that is used to numerically solve the equations and Typically, Gummel and Newton are used. So here are some examples from some of my models. Um, the, I have the commented one is something I use for some simulations, and then the non-commented one is for other simulation. As you can see, you can add more uh, more models that just uh, refines your simulation. Okay, and then after you specified. Um, Basically, what is uh, the structure of your, of your devices? Uh, then you want to move on to, to the solving. Uh, before solving, you want to specify what types of information you want to include in your output files. So as Ying was saying, there's two types of output files. One is the out files, or, which are saved in the SDR format. And then the other is the log files. So for a log file, you're saving basically one information for data points. What I mean by that is you can do like an IV where you say, for example, here, log out file, the IV, and then you solve at different voltages and that'll save the current at each of those voltages. And that's good for a normal like IV plot. If you want like field distribution, uh, carrier distribution, uh, light, uh, 
like concentration or stuff like that, then you need a 3D file, which is a stream file. And for those, you need to use the output file. And you want to specify here on the first line output, you want to specify what you want to include in your out file. So in my case, I wanted the band parameters, conduction band, valence band. I wanted the flow lines, which in this case is the electron uh, flows, the, the current, the optical intensity, and the impact rate, ionization rate. So after you specify that, you can start solving. The, it's good to always start from solve init. So initialize, uh, that'll so, uh, start solving the structure at zero applied uh, bias and zero injection from the outside, injection of charges or injection of light. And then once you solve the structure from here, you can start, for example, ramping up the voltage and uh, you specify the voltage of the cathode, for example, in this case, and you start ramping it up. And you can do it by steps if you're interested in something like an IV. So to show you the difference between uh, a log file and a stream file, you can see, for example, here, uh, this is Tony Plot, this, the, the tool that Ying was uh, mentioning earlier. On the left, you have a log, a typical uh, log plot. So this is an IV. And on the right, you have some of the structure files. So you can see, I think this is an electric field distribution, uh, some like impact ionization and uh, band, uh, like uh, band diagrams and generation rates. So I am gonna just show some typical results that we get uh, from Silvaco and that we use in my group. Uh, this is, these are both uh, IVs. Um, for example, IVs at dark, since we build uh, photo detectors, we would like to know the IVs at dark and at some illumination power. And these are two examples as a function of illumination power. And what you can do is, such as in this case, you can include or exclude some of the models and see how this impacts the IV, for example. Uh, because like I said, we like to build three-dimensional devices. Uh, this is the field distribution, for example, in the device that I was showing earlier. And uh, as you can see, you can uh, plot the field distribution across all the layers and here the arrows specify the electric current in the device in a 3D fashion or 2D. You can plot the band structure. These are typically very interesting in my, in my field. Uh, this is what they look like in Tony plot, but you can also export them and replot them however you like or do your own calculation based on the, on the band uh, structure. Uh, for some types of port de detectors, you might be interested in, in internal gain, or this is probably the case also for transistors. Uh, so you can calculate, you can have internal defined function in Silvaco to calculate, for example, the gain uh, as a function of the power or the size of the device or stuff like that. And finally, we have used this uh, again to understand some of the physics that is going on in, in our devices. Um, some of the built-in model allow you to explore uh, some uh, like uh, exotic, more exotic uh, phenomena, such as, for example, avalanche and impact ionization. And this is a simulation that we did in two different types of, uh, of band structure to see when the avalanche uh, onset uh, happens in our devices and at what interfaces. So I think that was it for me. And if you have any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. Does anyone have any questions? If not, we can take a short break and then come back for the demonstrations. I see one question. Okay. Uh, John is asking, is your 3D model assuming 3D version of the cross section is radially constructed or rectangularly into the page? <laughs> John, this is a great question. I, I couldn't answer this question for a long time. Um, so it's actually uh, radially constructed. Uh, the reason 
I cared about this is because the way you define the illumination is also actual symmetric. And so if you want to calculate the, um, the total light power that you're sending in, you need to know what is the, what is the area and that, that changes. So yeah, hope that answered your question. So I have two more questions. Can the software simulate thermal profiles? Yes, definitely. Uh, does it support non-gamma point simulations such as X? Yes, that as well. Um, I should say that there's a there's a fairly large scientific community around this. Uh, especially, it's like, for example, Purdue University has a couple of groups that work with Silvaco. Uh, so they are working on developing like more um, exotic models, such as they have a graphene model now. They have superconducting models. Uh, those are like more recent, so they 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 keep adding more models. So if you're interested in something like uh, I don't know thermoelectrics or piezoelectrics, they if they don't have it, you might find some publication or you might find that they will add them soon or they have a demo maybe. Can you please tell something about Dev edit. What is the basic difference between dev edit and deck build? I do not know what dev edit is. Does it support non-crystalline material? Yes, definitely. Uh, how long do these simulations typically take? Okay, so that depends a lot. Um, some simulation are pretty heavy, such as I do a lot of like small signal analysis, like AC. AC type uh, simulation or, or transient, those are very, uh, I mean, they might take like half an hour. Um, if you care about like the band structure, IVs and stuff like that, those are typically fast. I mean, again, all of this depends on what type of mesh uh, you're working with. Um, but I would say with a, with a decent mesh refinement, you're looking at something between 10 minutes and one hour. Uh, does the software run locally or on a server? Um, the software is right now on a new fab server, uh, but I don't know much more about that. I, and I don't know what the plans are in the future, but I would say simulation power is not, not a big limitation as of now. Okay, I think that's that's it with the questions. I don't see any more questions. Oh, what is the smallest scale and largest scale it can simulate? Ah, that's that's a good question. I have simulated some three nanometer, two nanometer thick oxides, for example. So it has atom atomistic simulation. So I think smallest scale, scale is not necessarily a problem. Uh, obviously it doesn't do like density functional theory or molecular dynamics. Uh, largest scale, I think this depends on the mesh. I would say you could probably simulate, I typically simulate like tens or hundreds of micron across. Uh, you can probably simulate millimeters, I would say but I haven't tried this myself. I, I want to address on the smallest uh, mm -hmm. scale because uh, it's not about the software can handle it or not. So as long as you set up the mesh, it can handle the mesh. So what it handles is actually the mesh. The thing is that when you go really, really small, uh, you have the quantum effect come out. And, um, and the, not the package we purchased now is using the seven classical uh, functions, uh, the equations. So it doesn't address, address the quantum phenomena so well, especially you go atomic, atomic layers. And uh, uh, so say to uh, three nanometers, you have like a couple of atomic layer. And uh, that is when the quantum effect come out to take the major 
uh, effect. And uh, the software used Simon Classical, which is like uh, uh, basically the classical transport uh, equations with some uh, uh, corrections and the manner, uh, you know, uh, change and plus a little bit quantum effect. So when, but uh, it has a limit. When the device gets really small, this kind of model doesn't work anymore. It doesn't give a good simulation. So this is when you cannot go lower. Yeah, I have two more questions. Um, can you simulate the interaction between multiple devices? Um, yes, in terms of semiconductor model. If you want to do something like SPICE, like, a, like a, for example, microwave propagation or stuff like that, uh, Sylvaco cannot do that. Um, can you add? B field in simulation, I believe so. I have never done it myself, but they have a lot of like uh, uh, memories. I think maybe Ying knows this. Uh, I I would I know, bet. I know they can. can do that, but I never did that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that's it for the question. Thank you guys for the questions. Sure, why don't we take a, about a five minute break then and uh, come back for the demonstrations. Sound good? So I hope everybody's back. Okay, before I go into the demo, uh, I will show briefly that uh, you, how we get access to the software. Uh, so because the software doesn't need to be uh, it doesn't need to be physically in front of something. So you can remotely log in a server. So we host it on a Linux server and you can connect it uh, to from anywhere. So the first thing that you want to make sure you open the, uh, the Northwestern VPN, logging that. And uh, I'm logging in use my Mac. So this is how people use Mac. Windows may be a little bit different, but the idea is the same. So open the terminal and uh, just start. So you will need a username and uh, that is what you need to contact me for if you really want to use it. password. Okay. So now uh, give me a second. <laughs> uh, somehow I stopped the sharing. Uh, Let me share again. All right, and, uh, and then the next step is use a VNC to connect to it. And then we're at the server. So this is my account. And you will log in the desktop of the uh, server. So uh, I I don't know if everybody's from Northwestern or not, but uh, if you want to get into this, the first uh, requirement is you need a net ID because that is you how you uh, connect to the uh, Northwestern VPN. And once you get that, uh, I can get you the account. All right. So this is the package this folder for the packet and we have a deck build. There's a lot of things inside, but you don't worry about this open the deck build. Okay. All right, before we start anything, I will show you what the design for this 
Okay. For this person. Okay, so uh, as I said, we're going to do a bipolar junction, uh, NPN junction. And uh, here's uh, the steps. So uh, that the steps to make this bipolar junction. So first we will define a uh, N-dope substrate. So that's the N region here. And then we'll P-dope some area for this P region. And then we will deposit the silicon, end of the silicon and etch the silicon out. So this makes the end of area. And then we will do some deposition of silicon oxide and etch the silicon oxide that is the spacer used to between N and P. So this spacer for the contacts. And then we will put additional P dope and then we'll deposit aluminum and etch the aluminum to make the contacts. So this is the flow design for this process. And uh, before that, as uh, Simone said, first thing is we define the mesh. Uh, so because first when we take a look at the device, it's mirror symmetric. So uh, we want to, I want to make things simply, simple, simpler. So I want to just uh, focus on this part. And uh, after I finish building up everything, for this part, and then I can do a mirror reflection and I get a full part. Okay, so this is just the half of the device. And uh, now I need to do the mesh. So uh, <clears throat> the mesh is the idea for the mesh is you won't have final mesh at the surface, at, at the interface, at the critical point, critical area. For example, uh, so this N and the P interface, we won't have a final grid and this is NP final grid. Also on the top, because we're going to do the contacts and uh, this is also some interface too and we're going to put final grids at the, at the top too. And uh, here's the lines uh, that is used to define the grids. <clears throat> so it's very simple, it just say line uh, and uh, in the X direction, the location is from zero in X and the spacing is 0 0.03. So the unit is micrometer. <clears throat> so this is the lines. I'm not going to go in details to explain how we define, but it follows the same format. <clears throat> and uh, this is I use for making this kind of grids and mesh. Okay. So this is just to introduce about uh, everything to start with. And now I'm going to <clears throat> open my well, so I have something already here. So this is uh, the lines that I just showed you before. So this is uh, the, for defining the grid, the mesh. And here I have a one more comment, one more line here is go Asana. So that means I'm going to use the Asana module to do the process simulation. <clears throat> so this is the things we could just get prepared. And this, but the bottles, so here I just put some comments here. So this is a steps that I'm going to do step by step. Uh, I will just follow this flow and fill up the commands for each step. Okay, uh, so we have for the uh, process simulation, uh, it's, we have a very great helper from here, the command is syntax dialogues. So this dialogue can make your life much easier for the process simulation. And uh, we have uh, this kind of uh, buttons, you can just push it. And it, the most important is also follows the order. So when you follow the order of the syntax, you're also following the order of so what you should do when you code in this deck build. Uh, so first we go to the initialization. So I put my here and then put the initialization. And the thing, uh, we use silicon substrate and our crystal orientation is 100. And uh, it's uh, uh, uniformly doped. So it's pre-doped and doped silicon substrate. So that's, I will select my dopant as um, arsenic. And I will here, I will put my concentration as 2E16. So it's pretty heavily doped. And then that's it. This is right. 
So you see, I come across this one. So here, I directly have one line down here. So it's initialized silicon C arsenic, the concentration of arsenic and the, uh, the orientation. Uh, okay, so the next one is clean off the native oxide. So this is we're going to use edge. So we're going to edge, so we have a bunch of lists here. I will select oxide and uh, I can go uh, see certain thickness. Uh, I'm going to put a pretty large number here. Uh, it's actually just so it will make sure I edge off the oxide. Okay. So, and then immediately I have one line here. So it says edge oxide dry and thickness is 0 0.5. So um, you have this line, but it doesn't mean you, you can only have this. So if you want to change anything, you just come here, change. I don't even can do this white, but that's fine. Okay, so the next is we want going to do the P-dope area. So what we're going to do is with the implanting bar and diffuse it. Uh, so we will go to the implant and we'll select uh, the impurity as bar and energy for uh, the energy first goes to 18 kilo EV and the dose. So those are the uh, the parameters when you do the implantation. So that's it. And that just right. I have a line here. I'm going to do the boron dope and uh, use this kind of energy and this dose. So I have tilt and rotations and the crystal. So um, <clears throat> actually I can remove this one. This, this is kind of default, you don't really need it. And uh, then I'm going to do the diffuse, uh, diffusing. So, so, so diffusing always comes with the implantation. And uh, I'm going to do is, so we start the time. So 60 minutes and uh, the temperature is to 920. So constant temperature. And you can also do the temperature ramp. So that's fine. And uh, use constant and temperature and uh, here we come okay so we also have the gas let me do this again so yeah so this is temperature and time so we also have different options with the gas you want to use so either oxide or nitride or you can even define a combination of the gas flow but uh, for this diffuse we use nitride let me write it again, you can just delete it. Okay, so this is a diffuse and the, the p-dope. Uh, so maybe at this point, you start wondering what kind of structure I got now. And then we can probably say, um, let's take a look the structure. So I here put uh, the save the final structure here. So this is a command. Okay, which is actually you can also use with uh, the output. So you can see I'm going to save one and I'm going to name it as a uh, workshop demo NPN. So you get, okay, so actually I need to put a str here anyway. Yeah, I should uh, put this str here. Okay, so this is how you can save the structure. And then I use this command. So to say use tiny plot and plot out the, the structure. Okay, so now let's see uh, with this much process and what we got. Close this one. So I can put my mouse down here and I have this function like the save and the run all the way to here. And this, oh no, this is actually save and run to line. So I'm going to do this one. And directly I got this plot. 
So you see, I have this uh, X and Y. So this is like, I don't have too much thing right now because I only doped the silicon. So I got a born dope, I got arsenic dope, and I got a net doping. So you see, this is uh, doping as a function of the uh, X. This is, this is, yeah, this is X. This is a Y direction. Yeah. So this is, at this moment, we only get the dopey. Okay, but we can keep building it. All right, so next is we will do uh, deposit polysilicon. And uh, stop this one. And uh, again, I will start with this one. So I will do a deposit polysilicon. And I will write a thickness of oh, of 0 0.3, see. And uh, so here is the uh, grid. So because you deposit polysilicon, this is another layer add on the, on, on the silicon. So you did a mesh for the silicon substrate, but you didn't do the mesh for this, uh, the additional layer here. So here's we can def we can add the grid, add the mesh for the silicon nitride, silicon, uh, polysilicon. So we can specify the grids. I'm going to do is I will put six layers. So from the Y direction, from top to down, and I have six grids to, 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 to slice the silicon, the polysilicon. And uh, for the edge, I also want to, because on the edge there's some, some features and I want to make sure I have a good uh, grid on edge as well. So I just like, Put it 0 0.1 here, 0 0.5, and you can write it. All right, see what we got now. <clears throat> so we have deposit polysilicon thickness and division is six, and minimum space is 0 0.5. So this is we got uh, six grid layers and 50 nanometer edge spacing. And now the next thing is okay, maybe we can take a look how it looks like now. And again, I'll run it. So now you see uh, we have, uh, so on the material side, we have silicon and polysilicon, and we have the dopant. Okay. And uh, again, so now we need to keep doing the pattern, the end of silicon. Oh no, actually we need, we need Dope the polysilicon first, not pattern. So end up the polysilicon and with the implanting arsenic. So we can do the implant again. So we do the arsenic and the dose is 7.5 E15 and energy is 50 keV and then just write it. Okay, so we got this implantation. And the next thing is we need to pattern this polysilicon. So because this polysilicon is, uh, is uh, the end area, so we don't need it everywhere. So we can to pattern it and we can edge part of the polysilicon. <clears throat> uh, I will see the material is polysilicon here. And uh, the geometry is uh, <clears throat> so right. So uh, the reason I choose right is I can quickly bring it up because this end area is going here. So I deposit here and I want edge from the right of this edge. Okay. So the right and the, all the right from 0 0.2 micrometer just write it okay so now again let's take a look what we got put it here okay so now you see we have silicon polysilicon and this is uh, 
this is this uh, skill is more makes sense. So this is X and this is Y, and uh, we have part is covered by polysilicon. So we can take a look at more. See, we can see uh, now at this point. Let's take a look at the mesh, how it looks on this picture. So you see this red green lines. Those are all the meshes, and uh, we can just remove it. And then we can also add this contour. This is going to be for the doping. And then, okay, so right now it has a bunch of op options. So you can choose this. Right now we have absolute night doping. It doesn't differentiate the NMP. So I'm going to use um, night doping. So that tells you the N type and P type. So you see we have this area is P type and this bottom is N and we have a polysilicon down here. So, okay, so this is what we got for now. And then let's keep adding. So when you do the polysilicon, it usually comes with a relaxed structure. So I will do the relaxed relax structure. And uh, um, nice. Uh, okay, so because polysilicon we have is one, two, into Y for two, like this. So we, here we have both uh, minimum. So this is how you define the area to, to, to relax. But uh, for example, if we kind of re remove them, Max, max, and that means from the x, the minimum zero point two to all the way down to the uh, the the end of the grade. So you will max everything. So you don't have to add them max here. And the direction uh, is fine. So the, then we can diffuse the end dope. So we will diffuse the end dope across this silic polysilicon. So we'll just do like. Um, Time is 25 minutes and the same temperature. And this time I'm going to use oxygen, try oxygen. And this is two step diffuse. So, hydrogen. Okay. All right, so we did the diffuse. So, and then at this point, we should have a pretty good dopant all across the uh, polysilicon. Okay, let's run it again and see what happened. Okay, so you see, because we did the oxygen diffusion, so we have a layer of silicon oxide uh, on the top. And this oxygen, this layer is thicker for the polysilicon and thinner for the crystal silicon. So, and we also tend to take a look at the doping. And again, I need to change this one to the not absolute one to net doping. And now you see uh, we have this red area for the end tap doping. So we have pretty well doped N region. So this is N and this is P and this is another N. So pretty good, we found this doping. All right, so now we are going to do the spacer. So the spacer is for we, when we put the contact for the emit between the emitter and the base. We will see as we do and what will happen. Deposit. Uh, Oxide. So we're going to put it oxide and thickness is 0 0.4. And uh, this oxide, I will also, because it's add on layer, so I'm also put some good mesh on it. So we have this statement for deposit oxide thickness is 0 0.4 and we have 10 grades 
and the, the grid at the edge is 0 0.1. And then we will need to, to edge the, okay, if you want to take a look at now, I can try that. And, uh, okay, so you see we have a pretty thick layer of silicon oxide that goes everywhere. And now we're going to etch it. So we're going to etch on top of this part and this part. So that to expose the contact area for the emitter and the base. So we're going to etch the location. So this is going to be the silicon oxide. And the location, actually we don't need to, uh, we, can, we can do, mm, oh, sickness, and 0 0.5, yes. So by this way we uniformly etch the silicon oxide and uh, we will leave some space there. Okay, see, we, after we etch, oxide use the dry method for 6.5 micrometer and see what we got. Okay, so now you see we have, even with uniformly edged 0 0.5 micrometer sitting oxide because the sitting oxide accumulates in this corner. So we still have something left here. So the silicon oxide is gonna be used for the spacer. All right. And now uh, we got the spacer. So we will do uh, more dope for the base. No, for the, for the, for the emitter. Okay, so let's do. Yeah. So I'm doing everything for this NPN uh, fabrication process. In your case, whatever you want, whatever process you want to do, you just feel free to choose from here and just uh, click the button and into the parameters. It's going to be pretty straightforward. So to dope with boron. And the dose is 1E15 and the energy is 30. Okay, and this also follows with the diffuse. And the diffuse is with 60 minutes, temperature 900, and uh, it's gonna be with nitrogen. All right. Okay, so now let's take a look at, we change the doping and take a look at how this doping looks like now. I run it again. Okay, so this is still the material structure. And I'm gonna bring up the doping, contour, apply, and uh, change it to net doping. Okay, so you see uh, the color start to change because of the spacer and then not so much end dope come to down to this area, but this lot of go down to here. So this forms a P plus region, and uh, this is a little bit less to P dope. So, okay, so this is how this uh, additional doping changed the doping uh, contour in the inside the structure. Okay, all right, so we just uh, keep doing is now what we need is the uh, contacts. So, your lay. In industry, we use aluminum for the contacts. And uh, we will deposit aluminum. So, aluminum, yes. And uh, thickness is, don't need to be too thick, it's just a front contact. 50 nanometers is enough. And it's we also need to put additional grid on this add-on layer. So this one, so the edge doesn't match too much. So just come. All right, and then right. Okay, so this is with deposit 
aluminum with 0 point with 15 nanometer and uh, the grid is only two within this 15 nanometer. And uh, we now can etch the aluminum to form the contact. Go to this one. Edge. So we will choose the shape. You can pick any shape. So you, basically you can remove the materials, any shape you want. So we will remove aluminum. And uh, this is uh, where you're going to define the shape here. So the location I want to edge off this aluminum, I will start with um, five so, meter and uh, oh no, actually. Okay, so this is area I want to etch off the aluminum. All right, now we can take the, oh no, okay. Um, Yes, okay, I shouldn't put, so see I cut off this line. <laughs> I just put this one here. This All right, so now we can take a look what we got now. Okay, so you see uh, we have this and this additional aluminum layer here. So this is up to deposition and edge. So, okay, so we basically build up everything. Let me bring up this. Build up the structure for, for everything. Oh. So uh, the next thing is we're ready to do the mirror ref reflect. So do this again. The structure we can mirror it. So mirror to the left. Okay, so this is this structure mirror left. And now we take a final look at uh, this. Okay, so now we have this full structure for the NPN and also with the contacts. So we can display and uh, take, I add the doping and change to the net doping. Okay, so you see, this is a structure we built after those many steps. So we have silicon, oxide, aluminum, polysilicon, and we have this N, the red color for the N-doping region, the purple color for the P-dope, and we also have the base at the other N-dope. So this is how the NPN bipolar junction is built and how it looks like after the simulation. Okay, so you can check and see if this is what you want and if something is different and you just can go back here and uh, change some parameters. That's easily some like kind of diffusion time and the diffusion temperature, this is something easy to change and this usually affects quite a bit. And uh, yeah, that is about the uh, device simulations, uh, sorry, the process simulation. Uh, any question, let me see. Mm. Oh, I didn't get any question. Oh. Mm. 
Any question? Okay, uh, so if nobody have any question, then we can go to the next demo for the uh, device simulation. So, but when we do the device simulation, it may not be. So we have the very good helper for the process simulation, but when we come to the device one, it's not that helpful anymore. Right, so I will load the file for the device simulation. Okay, so it's again can be some some codes we need to fill up in and Let's start with the uh, basics first and uh, what we're going to do. Okay. All right, so uh, this is going to be for a uh, PIN diode and this is the structure for the PIN diode. So it has P dope and uh, I uh, and N dope. So this usually is like a a uh, silicon wafer and then you dope some P on the top and dope some N at the bottom. So this is how it made. And then we have contacts on the top and on the bottom. And when the light comes in, it will uh, generate some uh, carriers inside this at the interface. And when you have the uh, car a voltage bias applied between these two contacts and the carriers start to flow to a certain direction and that forms a current, that's a photo current. And uh, in this demo, we will uh, first de define the doping and the regions. So one thing that as we did in the, in the process simulation, uh, you can output a file. And uh, one option is that you can keep going and uh, import that file into the device simulation and uh, do the simulation. And another thing is that if you don't want to start with the process simulation and you, you don't have to, and there's option that you can just simply define a have P and end up over there, define the region. And you don't need to start with how I made the region. It's tell it I have this region. So this is the define regions. And then this, uh, the physics come, kicks in. So we will need to tell this, uh, the software that which physics models we're going to use and the models describe how the carriers generated and how the carriers driven by the current, uh, by the voltage. And you then- You're not the, sharing the screen, at least I'm oh, not. really? Yeah. <laughs> so sorry. Ah, uh, so sorry. Okay. All right, okay. Uh, all right, so this is the device we're gonna build. Uh, so sorry. Okay, so uh, first thing is we're gonna define the region for the PIN. Uh, and the second is we can select physics models for carrier. So it basically describes how the light excites carriers and how the carrier is driven by the voltage. And then we'll set up the initial operation bias, which means the DC bias applied between this contact and this contact. And then uh, we will define the light the, here. So like what kind of wavelength, what's the intensity. And then we will solve this uh, device to get to the optical response. So this is the flow. Again, we can start with the mesh again. Uh, so this mesh, so I just directly put the mesh picture here because you already see this kind of mesh in the previous demo. So we have uh, the top part is P dope and the bottom part is N dope. And in the middle we have the I because the interface is around here and here. So we put more grids at uh, the top bottom, at top and the bottom. 
So, and we don't need too many grids in this I. So uh, this, so the equation that we will select later, it will solve this differential equations at nodes. So this is this is where we can get the result and put it in the space. Okay. So here's a statement for the mesh. Uh, so again, it's pretty simple. And in the x direction, the mesh location at zero. So, so we start from zero here and uh, in the X direction, we don't have any special or special interested areas. So we just put it uniformly meshed. So from zero to 10 is spacing is 0 0.25. And from Y, so we have two interested areas, top and bottom. So that's why we put the location when location at zero, we have final grade and when location at 10 at final grade. Once in the middle, we have a bigger grade. All right, so this is just a brief about uh, how we set up the mesh. Um, so here is, um, yeah. here, okay. And what? Okay. Uh, I load the uh, uh, the the oh okay the 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 file we will start with so. And here, I like the process simulation, we need to define which module we're going to use. So this is go at us, means we will go, we will do the uh, process, the device simulation. I put a title here, it's not very important. And uh, here, the first section is for define the mesh. And uh, here, I just put a mesh here. So I'm not going to go through it again. The second part is we're going to define the structure. Uh, as I said, there's two options. Either you can import this, uh, the uh, output file from the process simulation, or you can do the de region define. Um, I want to show you the region define uh, so, you, so that you know another option. Um, okay, so we're still going to start with this syntax dialog. Uh, the syntax dialogs help us really quite a bit uh, in the process simulation, but you will find it's not so good when we do the device. So we have this page for the process dialog and we have this page for the device dialog. And uh, this is, shows the options it have. And the important thing is also shows the order. So you just follow the order and then you don't have to memorize what this TCAT ask you, the order it defines. So just to follow this simple order. Okay, so first thing we did the mesh already, and then we will do the region. Okay, I will add a region. So we will have um, silicon, the material is silicon. So you can click on that and this is a, all the built-in semiconductor materials. And uh, we can fill up, fill up all the space with the silicon. So we define a area for 10 micrometer by 10 micrometer. So this is silicon, just write it. Okay. All right, so you see I have this one for uh, region number one and the uh, uh, material is silicon and this is the uh, area for the silicon. Okay, so the, sec the next one is electrode. Uh, electrode, in this case, we will have two electrodes, one anode on the top of the device and one cathode at the bottom of the device. So I will select, we can have electrode for anode and cathode. So we have two 
electrode and the location, I need to give it a location. So for the X is equal across all the X from zero to 10. And uh, so because this one is at the top, I'll put it like, um, yeah. and then through. And for the cathode, we have zero to 10 and uh, 10 C. So this is when you fill up the space. So it asks you to fill up those numbers when you use the dialog. Let's see what it gives us. So it gives us electrode name and the electrode number. So number one is for anode. And this is uh, the region for it, for the, for the, the area for the, the electrode. Actually, you don't have to follow exactly what it gives you. For example, we can put, because this cathode is at the bottom. So simply just the inter bottom, it will give you this cathode. And this one, uh, like you don't have to do the minimum. So the maximum is zero. Okay, so now uh, let's take a look what we got for now. We have entered so many things. And uh, okay, so I already put the structure file here. So it's follow the same thing. Uh, if you want to do the check it. So first it will output a file for the structure and then we'll use Tony plot to, to plot it out. Okay, I just put my mask here and then I will run it to this line. Okay, so we don't see too much here yet. And we have only two things, silicon and conductor. But uh, what we can see is we have the mesh here. And we also can take a look at the contour, the doping. And now we didn't dope anything yet. So it's uniformly just the substrate doping. Okay, let's keep add on. So electrode, we have something kicking. Okay, so this is the electrode we just did, and then now we define the doping. So yeah, here is the doping. And uh, there's something like uh, you can select for the doping. Uh, this is options for this for this dialogue gives you, um, but again, you're not limited to these options. You can use it to help you write something there and then later you revise this statement. Uh, as Simone showed in his, uh, his uh, case, he put uniform and he defined the pillar uh, st uh, structure and he even defined the gradient structure. So this is a little bit a higher function. I'm not going to go through it. I'll just show you if we use this dialogue, what we can do. So I will do is uh, doping. Oh, the concentration is, did I define the, oh, okay. I didn't define, okay. So the same is I didn't, I just defined the substrate. I didn't give it doping yet. Substrate really comes with a doping. So I will first do the substrate, tell, tell the system how the substrate is doping, doped. So now to a uh, uniform for this substrate. And uh, the concentration is 1E14. So it's gonna be n tap. So it's a slightly doped. So here I got uh, doping uniform. And uh, so this means everywhere we have this kind of doping. And uh, uh, if you want to confirm that you link this doping to this material, you can specify, I'm putting the doping on the region equals to one. So 
this is you link this to this region number one. Okay, now I will define the doping for the P and N. Um, so that one comes with a Gaussian distribution with characterization lens. So let's do the P dope first. I will select the P dope and the doping concentration is one E higher doping concentration and the characterization lens is 0 0.1. So this is Gaussian distribution within this lens. And uh, write it. Okay. Oh, the one, sorry, one more thing. I forgot to tell which, which direction. Uh, yes, I need to make sure. Yeah, this is the one. P type in the peak. This, I forgot this one. So the peak position tells you where where the doping doping. So the Gaussian distribution has a peak. So where the peak location is. So I need to tell the P doping and on the top on the top. So this is where the y equals to zero. Okay. And uh, we have the doping, Gaussian, and uh, with calculation lens of 100 nanometer and peak locates at the top surface, surface and concentration this much and it's P-dope and direction is goes in Y direction. Okay, so now I will define the doping, doping for the N-dope region. So it's still the same thing, but uh, the position need to change to 10, okay. So, and this is n dope. Okay, so I'm done with the doping defined and let's see what we got. Okay, so on the material structure, we don't have too much difference, but uh, when we see the doping here, and again, I'll need to select the Net doping. So you see we have a color come up here and here. So that is the end up here and this is P dope here and you see it's a gradient a little bit down here. So that is the, the lens, the doping lens you define here. So now we have this PIN junction and uh, we, did, we get this proper doping. So the next thing is uh, we're going to do the model. So the model part is not uh, very straightforward. So this is when your uh, physics knowledge come in. And uh, we'll just do this. Okay, so I, because, so when you do this and you click on it, this is so not so much thing helpful. So there's some thing you can select, but I would recommend you to do the, to enter by yourself. And uh, here I enter the materials. Uh, this is for the silicon and also the model. So, but still this one is not so helpful, but it's good that you can still follow the order and the model, will have, we're going to do the model and the materials. So here I, I put the material first, it doesn't matter too much. Uh, so material, uh, so we did with statement that this is material. So that means I'm going to define the material and the material equal to silicon. That means I have the silicon material and the T tau P. So tau P, that is a P uh, carrier uh, with the, the, lab, the lifetime of P carrier. So that is two E minus six second. And also the N carrier is two E minus six seconds too. So this is um, um, the carrier lifetime comes with the silicon uh, material. So this software has its built in material uh, parameters for silicon. And you can take, you can just delete all this, uh, this, this, this parameter and use the, default silicon parameters. And if you want to modify, you just bring up the parameter and overwrite it. So this is how you overwrite a, a, a parameter for a material. 
Okay, so here comes the models. So when you define the models, you need to be able to understand what happened for your for the photo electron for the photo current. So here I have some models entered already. Uh, they have so many models and I can't explain everyone. And I just uh, explain right now what I put here. So this SRH is Schottky rate hall recombination. So uh, uh, it uses fixed minority carrier lifetime. And uh, so this one should be used for most simulations. So this is very basic. Uh, model and the uh, anger is uh, anger recombina re re recombination. So I believe everybody knows that. So this is uh, a direct transition of carriers and uh, you will need it when you have a uh, high current intensity. So this is when the carrier in the, in the transition and they have some recombination and the uh, calm uh, this is calm mobile. So this is, this is a concentration dependent mobility. It's because we have P and P I N dope. So we have different uh, concentration of the carriers. And uh, this one will enable the car concentration dependent mobility. And um, uh, it's, so this one, especially for silicon and gallium arsenic. And then this FDLD mobile is parallel field mobility. So this is also again, especially for the silicon and gallium arsenic models. And um, uh, I'm not going to go through deeply into these models. And uh, if you are interested, and you can always look into the menu or even you look into your semiconductor textbook, you can find the equation for those models. So the thing is that which model you put here, it really matters with your result. Uh, so you can do experiment like what kind of model you want to include, like what kind of effect you would put in consideration and how it matters and how your result comes out. Uh, if your result doesn't, if your simulation result doesn't match what you observe, that means you definitely have something missing. Uh, either you didn't have the material parameter right or you didn't have the model right. So this is a tricky part and this is where your physics knowledge comes in. Okay. All right. Uh, so I have an initial solution here. So uh, this is uh, something specially for this TCAD. So it always asks you to initialize the solution before you really do anything. So it is very typical. Uh, and it's like kind of requires statement for no reason and just put it there. Okay, so here I will have the optical source specification. So it's basically the parameters for the light. Uh, so I have a beam statement and I have number number one, uh, actually I don't need the number one. So I have only one beam. If you have more, you have, have can number two, number three. Uh, so this tells you I have number one beam and X and Y origin is uh, where the light source locates. So I just put it, uh, so in this case, actually I have a uniform light. So the origin doesn't matter. Um, so I just random put it so in the middle of the, in X direction, just in the middle of the device, in Y in direction, I put it out of the uh, device. So negative zero one and angle is like an instant angle. So it's 90 degrees so vertically go down to the device and wavelength. So, so far I just put 0 0.5, 0 0.4 uh, micrometer. So this is 400 nanometer. This is something that I can change later. Okay, so here um, I have the, uh, so now I have the device, I have the beam, and then actually I can, I can do some calculation, do some simulation and see what we got. So here I define the method. So the method is another thing that you need to look into. Uh, so this software has three uh, major numerical methods. If you're familiar with numerical simulation, you may probably read, be able to read from the name. So uh, I, so here we use a Newton 
Newton means um, it solves the total system uh, with all the unknowns together. So it's useful, especially when the system of the equation is strongly coupled. Uh, I mean, this is, Newton is mostly generic, so it can fit in every case. And it has also different uh, uh, numerical methods like a block, uh, a gamma. So this is, I mean, if you're familiar with numerical methods, so this can make some sense to you. All right, uh, so, and I initiated the simulation again. So this is V cathode. So I apply a voltage on the cathode. So I apply 0 0.2 volt. Yeah, this is our, my DC bias. And uh, actually I can, I can run the simulation. So, uh, so, for, so now we're all set to run. So we have the device, we specified all the methods, all the materials and all the, and even applied a, applied a, 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 a bias. So now it's like, if we run this, we're gonna have only single outputs. So because you have a beam specified and you have a, a bias voltage specified, you don't have any variable for the sweep, so it's not going to make a, a curve. It's only a point in the in, in the simulation. So uh, I want to put something like a variable and uh, see if we can get a curve. And uh, so the variable I choose here is the wavelength for the light. And uh, here's some basic statement for defining the uh, the the variables. So first I have a log. Uh, so this log means, uh, this log is mostly used for the electrical uh, uh, curves like voltage or current. So it's single, cur single, single point saved in this log file. And uh, we just uh, create this log file. So this is a name. And then here is the variables. So as you see from here, we have uh, this number is changing. It's lambda. Lambda is directly the lambda for the light. It's the wavelength. So I change the wavelength from 0 0.1 micrometer to 0 0.8 micrometer, and uh, I have a constant beam uh, intensity as one, which means one watts per centimeter square. And then I just uh, solve the condition with this kind of beam power and this kind of wavelength, and eventually. Uh, so this, all the solutions will be automatically saved into this log file. And eventually I will use Tommy plot to plot out the, the log file. Okay, so let's see if I run this, what I will get. Okay, I will close this. Oh, where's my, okay. So here is the Tommy plot output. So here I have the optical wavelength and I have the cathode current. This is the photo current. Uh, so at this point, you have created the photo current as a function of wavelength. And if you want to change anything, let's say if you want to optimize the device and see there's so many parameters we have entered and you can just easily just change one parameter and see how it affects with your, uh, your curve. And also there's options that you can add uh, coating layers on top of this device and see how that film, the coating film in uh, changes this photo response. Okay, so this is for the device simulation. Uh, any questions so far? Let me see. Okay. Oh. So nobody asks questions. <laughs> I hope everybody follows, but it's a little bit heavy coding thing.
All right. Kitty, do you want to say something? Sorry, I was on unmuting. Um, no, just uh, thank you everyone for coming. Um, we'll be sending out a survey tomorrow morning um, to gauge your interest in the software. Um, please let us know your thoughts and feel free to reach out to anyone here at Nuance and NewFab if you have any follow-up questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Ying and Simone.